Bea ua ae malo faiva o le moana pasifika. E ala ilana ta alo na ili nava yaso. Ma alo le ta alo, ma alo le finau. Fa manu ia le atua. Past and current Pacific players are proud of what you've done. Our people are so proud of what you've done. But more importantly, you've inspired the next generation of young Pacifica players. Congratulations. Chahu! Breakdown is brought to you by Neurofen Zavance. Available every day at Chemist Warehouse. Malo Elele, Talo Falava, and good evening. Welcome into the breakdown for another week. Joining you today, the usual suspect, Sir John Kerwin. We're very lucky to be joined by a very special guest, Faono Ken Laban, and Mills Muliana as well. Uh, Want to hear another one of those Chahoos, Mills? <laughs> that was so good. I tell you, it's a lot different when I've got a bit of alcohol in me. Uh, <laughs> the, old, the old throat's rolling around a bit much at the moment. But uh, what, a, what a wonderful weekend, a wonderful weekend also for our. Uh, Moana Pacifica, so proud, and uh, I'm sure, um, Faono, you, you would be too. Mm. Yes, well, it's been, um, it's been a heck of a journey for them in a very short period of time. Um, for them, I think, you know, given the, the nature and quality of the New Zealand teams, there weren't too many of us were picking that they would beat any of the New mm. Zealand teams and that they would, we would have to wait until the Trans-Tasman part of Pacifica before, um, before they could record a win. But uh, tremendous circumstances on the weekend. They showed a lot of heart, um, great effort at the end, and a well-deserved victory. To celebrate what happened uh, with Moana Pacifica on Friday, we need to look back, don't we, JK, at some of the giants that you would have played with in the past. Yeah, I mean, f for me, it's just... I, I mean, I want to see this translate into uh, better international results, and I think that's going to happen. You know, I wouldn't, wouldn't put it past Samoa, Tonga and, and Fiji performing way better. But Pacifica has been such a big part of, of my rugby career. I mean, I started with the great um, Joe Stanley, you know, who made me the player that was. He had the ability, Ken, to, to pass the ball for 30 yards and it would stay at the same, same sp speed and same height. And I used to run on and off it. He was the first guy that I sort of really uh, was in fear of. I was glad he was on my side for tackling. Um, then Inga, you know, a Ronnie Clark. And then towards the end, John Olomu, you know, he came along and I took one look at him, <laughs> one look at him, Ken, and said, so time to retire, JK. <laughs> time to retire, son. I mean, uh, this is the first ever rugby superstar, you know. He was Robin Williams, the comedian loved him, you know. Um, he opened so many different markets and he was from Tongan descent, Mills. Yeah. It's pretty awesome. I think for me, and in particular the fact that it's so inspirational because as a youngster, you, you grow up, and I grew up in Invercargill where there's predominantly European people down, but although I'm from Samoa, so I used to always look up to the likes of Ironi, the Michael Jones and that, and along the way you kind of forget your heritage a little bit. It wasn't until I came up to Auckland. And that's why I mean, it's, it's so empowering what they've actually done because of the fact that, um, you know, you're inspiring the next generation to, to grab hold of not only their culture, but also, um, you know, you know, be one of these guys that we're seeing on screen. I've got a question for you, Ken. So, was Brian Williams the first Pacifica player to play for the All Blacks? Uh, no, he wasn't. Walter Batty uh, Tongan was the first uh, Pacifica player to wear the All Black jersey in 1928. Frank Solomon was the first Samoan in 1931. And Arthur Jennings was the first Fijian in, um, in 1967. And it was interesting, JK, when you raised Ronnie's name um, in that previous conversation, and we talk a lot about the giants of the Pacifica community that have been involved. Rugby. So there's a very famous Samoan team in the 60s in uh, Wellington. Mene Mene, Bernice Mene's father, Yafeta Clark, Ironi's father, Falefasa Umanga, Tana's uh, father, Tia Tia Yeti Tia Tia, Philo's father um, were involved with that team, and in fact, Philo's father, Titi, um, Tia Tia Yeti Tia Tia, he was the first Samoan to play senior club rugby in Wellington. He was also one of the founding fathers of the Wellington Samoan rugby movement in 1973. And um, watching the image of um, Philo in the coaching box, I was thinking about his dad. If you're watching, my law lover of Fionga Tia Tia, my law lover Sui Fung um, and just to acknowledge um, that he was part of a wonderful generation. And on that subject, of a guy Yeti Tuaalola, <coughs> whose two grandsons 
uh, Salesi Rayasi and Sean Stevenson, who were first cousins, their mothers or sisters, and their Yeti's um, daughters. So, you you know, when we talk about um, Sir Brian Williams and Sir Michael Jones and those that are involved, and Sikopi Kepu, the captain of, of this Moana Pacifica team, plus Philo and, uh, and Aaron, you know, they do absolutely. There is a wonderful heritage and a wonderful contribution by previous generations that have established Pacific and, you know, all credit um, to the New Zealand Rugby Union. Looking forward to having Mark Robinson in here later in the programme to talk about this because, as Mills said, this represents progress, it represents hopes, and at the risk of sounding corny, this represents everything <coughs> we hope Yep. that people will take out of a, a Moana Pacifica team like this to win against an established opponent. Mills, does it translate into international results, which is what I'm hoping? Oh, I, think all, I think it will one day. I think this is the start and you know, the next generation that are coming through and what these guys have done, definitely it should. Next World Cup. <laughs> Not the next he doesn't one. want to say. One after. He doesn't want to say. We're going to continue uh, this conversation, but first, how good were the crowds over the weekend? We will see it soon. But we're crossing the Tasman to the SCG, the Sydney Cricket Ground, because take a look at what happened over there. This guy, Buddy Franklin's 1,000th goal in the AFL. Take a look what happens after he nails this, guys. I reckon you'll love it, JK. Oh, oh man, that is crazy. How good. The game wasn't over. Was that the final shot of the game? <laughs> it wasn't over. It took them half an hour to clear the field so that they could get play back underway. Absolute oh, that's, scenes. That's amazing. I remember having a day like that um, at the Ranfurly Shield when Auckland won it. The crowd just came on. Just, it was just this amazing sort of, I don't know if it was a celebration. Into Canterbury? And, yeah. <laughs> it's crazy. We used to go on the field back in my day, eh? Hey? Yeah. Our day. Our day. They, they, Our didn't, day. they didn't come on and punch you, did they, some of these crowds, were they? <laughs> no, no, no. Are no, 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 you no. sure? No, I got off there pretty quick. <laughs> <laughs> they went for someone bigger like David Kirk. <laughs> <laughs> well, expect the unexpected when uh, you're playing a game of footy, and that's exactly what happened in Littleton, New Zealand. You'll like this one, too. Up to <laughs> Watch out! <laughs> Jesus! <laughs> 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 Jesus arrived out of the sky in a paraglider. <laughs> <laughs> that? well, that's one way to win a lineup. <laughs> Whoops, but that's it was so brilliant. New Zealand, though, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Uh, where did he come from? <laughs> He literally <laughs> dropped out of the sky, didn't he? Literally dropped out of the sky. Uh, on the breakdown, we have a brand new sponsor on board. We're very excited about this one. Super Rugby with Nurofen available at Chemist Warehouse. Now, we've talked about the giants of Pacifica Rugby, but we have to talk about the spectacle and the rugby that we saw on Friday night. Mills, you were there, and Moana, they stayed in it the entire time. They were so close, and then they won it in Golden Point. Oh, and just the, the way they won it, the fashion they won it at, at, at the end. You know, the Hurricanes, you know, obviously won the toss for gold, Golden Point. You know, they sort of attacked and went down in, the, in their own sort of 22. But then, um, you know, the, to turn it over, and go all the way, you know, down the other end and, and win it like that was, you know, absolutely amazing. You, could, you, you were there too, Kirsty, but on the sideline, I wish there was more crowd. And it seemed like there was because, the, you know, the, the, the elation and, um, and, uh, and the music and, and how proud these guys were. So, so awesome. So, and, and you look at that. I mean, you talk about Tia Tia, um, Ken, and, and the way they've, I mean, they've spoken about the culture that they've built within this team and to finally get over JK, I mean, a little bit earlier than what everyone has expected, but so good. Yeah, I've noticed both with the Fiji Ndurua and Moana Pacifica that for me, it, it's like they're building confidence. They don't seem they're in the game and then they hang in there and they seem to build confidence. And, and that last try for me was just, wow. Now we can believe. And I noticed that with the Drua too, Ken. Sometimes when the game's over, it's when they sort of go, wow, you know, we're better than this, and they, they really kick on. But, you know, I, I think including them has already paid off. And I think a win like that for Moana Pacifica is just going to go right. They're here for good. We need to try and make sure that there's not financial or any other yeah. problems off the field that's going to stop them moving forward now, Ken. Yeah, well, occasionally over time we hear... Um patronising and condescending comments about um, certain type of athletes who are talented but sometimes lack the effort. And one of the things I would, that I was really, really impressed with um, Danny Tuala's effort at the, end of the, uh, at the end of the game is that that doesn't require any talent to do what he did. That's just him. That's all effort. 
um, and it was in, and it was in extra time. Somebody had to make a play um, out of the 15 in the Hurricanes and the 15 at the thing. And my understanding is it was Henry Stouts, who had a stormer of a game, mm. stole the ball at the breakdown, um, 75 metres up the other end, and he stayed in the chase. Uh, Danny Tuala, here's an image of the... So you don't need any talent for this. You just need to have the right attitude and be prepared to put in the effort, and you get rewarded. Fantastic finish. And we wouldn't have had Mills's intro tonight if it hadn't been for, um, for Danny Tuala in that effort. There's so much to admire in the way that they won that game. And, and, and also, to get them to that point, to golden, to golden point, they were penalised off the park. They had hardly any possession, and the Hurricanes, you know, had you know, a lot of territory as well, so they had all the ball. But to get them into that last 10 minutes, to go back to your point, JK, that inspired them. They were almost slipping. Well, that actually didn't inspire them because they were right in the game. They were hitting bodies like, like there was no tomorrow. But to finish the way they did, you know, so great. And there'll be a bigger crowd back at Mount Smart Stadium on Tuesday when they take on the Blues. You'd think, JK, after this inspiring performance. Yeah, and, and look, I think the, what we're starting... You know, when you, when you talk about Super Rugby, you know, if I asked you what the Crusaders, how they play, how the Crusaders play, everyone will tell you. You know, how the Blues play, everyone will tell you. How do the Hurricanes play? And the Hurricanes and Blues are probably closest from an expanse point of view. But Moana Pacific are starting to get how do they play. Yeah. They're going to hit you. They're going to hang in the game. You know, they're going to be really physical. They probably need to be a little bit more disciplined, but they can sort that out. So we know that on Tuesday night it's going to be fireworks. We don't know what sort of teams are going to play because we're playing each other midweek and there's also games coming up. So that might be a bit interesting. Let's just say, for example, just offering up some thoughts here, let's just say they win four more games mm. this oh, year. Oh, against Ken. And uh, oh, whatever. Let's just say they win four games. All of a sudden, their key players are talked about as mm. potential Super Rugby players, potential professional players anywhere in the world. Yeah. Yeah. That will be a test of, um, of their resilience. That will be a test of the contracting situation. That will be a test of a whole host of um, things, you know, initially. And I, and, I, and I was quite, as you know, I was quite vocal in, in my frustration over what I thought was an unfair playing field with regard to them not having access to all the top players mm. in the game. But if they start producing performances like that in the end, well, you know, you take... You know, if you were to ask me who was the best... Who's been the best number eight the first couple of weeks in the competition, Henry Stowers in the conversation. Totally. I totally agree with that. And I think that's interesting moving forward. I, I, th I, I disagree with you, Mills. I think that, actually, we will see a benefit straight away at international rugby. I think from... Fresh, especially from the Fiji draw. We know they've got world-class right. backs, but their forwards having to go week in, week out, I think, is going to be good. And I'm also hoping that some of this stuff will translate straight into international rugby. But I think there are the challenges moving forward. You're right, Ken. There are the challenges moving forward. But also, on the positive, maybe some players might want to come home if we can lift the contracts a wee bit. You know, some of the Pacifica that are already in Europe, we can get half one. of them home. Wow, that's got to be pretty special. Charles Peelton. We could keep talking about this all day, couldn't we? Uh, but we move on to the Blues game. They just, just got across the line. And every time the Blues win, JK is a very happy man. But I've got a question for the three of you. Uh, are we convinced by the Mills? Are we convinced by this Blues outfit? I, I, we're still not. I, I think hey. there's still a lot to go. Uh, I think... Hey, Millsy! To be totally honest, I mean, they... <laughs> Uh, against uh, it's been, you know, both games have been against the, uh, the the Highlanders, but the thing is they haven't sort of produced a, a real clinical sort of display, albeit that first sort of what sixty odd minutes against the Hurricanes, but then they ended up losing. So I think there's still there's still plenty to come from them. I think the inaccuracies are, uh, are sort of still there. The next couple of weeks is going to be big for them because they've got back to back games and how they sort of I don't want to use the word rotate how they pick their squads, but this is now a good time and the challenge is. Can they get up physically? Because we've seen Moana Pacifica and how sort of they've got up in the last couple of weeks. You know JK's lining you up now. No, I was just saying I knew I felt sick when I saw you in that jersey. <laughs> <laughs> Heritage. I'm gonna get you one <laughs> cut, I'm gonna get you one cut in half. Well, brother, we can't change history. No, look, I think <laughs> I, I don't think um, the Highlanders have been average. But actually I thought they showed a little bit of the old Highlanders the other night. They didn't make a lot of mistakes. They hung in the game. They started to attack with a bit of purpose. Aaron Smith started running with the ball, putting pressure on round the ruck. Um, I do agree with you, Bills, and I think, you know, Bowden going off, they had a little bit of disruption. They need to just score that extra try when they've got the opposition under the, the pump. Right. And they're yeah. just coming up short to, to 
go out to... Because I think in Super Rugby, if you get above 15 points, it's hard to recover. Anything below, teams can recover. So do they need a little bit more kill instinct? Yeah, I agree. But they are showing signs of, of a really... Um, you know, in the past, Mills, they would have lost down there under the you know, under the roof, and they've come out and they've won those. Sometimes not pretty, but for me, they're on the right track and looking exciting. They do need to finish a wee bit, though, Ken. Um, the Highlanders played 14 games in 2021 for eight wins and six losses. They're 0-5. Um, I'm stating the obvious now with these numbers, but I just want to make the observation that last year, in 14 of those games, Josh Ioane was either at 10, 15, or came off the bench and he's not there this year. They could have kept him, um, but they didn't. And I think that if you're looking for um, another smart player, um, I know he's only had a brief cameo at all black level, but we know how good he is. We know how good his footwork is. We know what a, you know, what a fabulous player he is um, with the ball, with a solid kicking game. Um, I just wonder in their quiet moments where they be, might be ruining the fact that they let uh, Josh Ioane leave and go to the Chiefs. And now he's sitting on the bench at the moment Chiefs. for the Chiefs. But um, how good is it to see wingers in form, JK? Caleb Clark. Yeah. Sensational. I would just hate to mark him, <laughs> Mills. You know, he's got that big mully, if I can speak a little bit in... in uh, <laughs> and, and, and low hips. So if you have a look here, he's just so hard to tackle and so balanced. You know, his dad was like that. So was Inga. Because they've got low hips... Um, they're just so balanced. So that when he steps, it looks easy, but he's moving very, very fast and he's making a big step. And that, that's really hard to stop. You know, I'm, I'm really pleased for Caleb because last year was a tough year. You know, I talk about him spending three weeks in a hotel room watching everyone else in the Olympics, you know? Real character burning. He's come back, you know, it's, it's, it's big knowledge that he's been close to, to Roger Tuavasa Sheik. But that means he wants to learn. He wants to keep getting better. And I'm just so pleased. And he gives us a different option, Mills, on the wing at the next level. But he has. And that's the thing. I mean, maybe the Roger Tuvasa Sheik, the influence of, that he's had has been uh, massive because he's showing that he's gotten himself to into a really nice groove. You know, he's, he's energetic. He gets around. He's working off the ball as well, which is something that's probably being criticised about. But he's also breaking the line and just being... Um, I suppose showing some real emotion about sort of when they're going out there and scoring tries. So I love the way he's progressing. I love the fact that he's, um, you know, getting his hands on the ball. It's when they have the quiet moments. This is the Blues have got to get him into the game when they have those little wee quiet pitches because he makes things happen. Uh, an update on Bowden Barrett as well. Of course, he uh, came off in the 41st minute with a head injury assessment. He's OK reporting no symptoms today, but the Blues are going to be cautious with him uh, and completely understandable. We move on to Hamilton because we had the great double header. Crowds at both games uh, over the weekend, Ken. Uh, but the Crusaders, they got one back. One apiece in this great rivalry. That is turning out to be a fantastic rivalry. Yes, it is. And what a wonderful job that uh, Clayton McMillan has done since taking over. Bearing in mind, he took over the team after previously having an 0-8 mm. record under Warren Gatlin. He's done a terrific job, got them into the final um, last year. But very, very competitive uh, this year in all of the games um, that they've played. And, and obviously, playing the Crusaders on any day is a tough ask. Um, and the Crusaders were too good um, this weekend. But the, we've seen enough from the Chiefs to see that they can be a threat this year. Talking about Caleb Clark, how good was that Sever Reese try? Yeah, outstanding. And interesting, he came off the bench and, yeah. and made a huge impact. I don't know if that could be something in the future that we need to think about. Um, look, I think the Chiefs didn't play well enough in the critical moments, Mills. I thought they were outstanding at times and they dropped the ball a couple of times when they'd made a couple of line breaks. And against the Crusaders, you have to play for 80 minutes and you've got to take every opportunity. And I think, especially two of those errors at the wrong time, um, just let the Crusaders off the hook. If you're going to beat the Crusaders, they have to be under immense pressure for 80 minutes. Just over 20 minutes to go. They're right in the game. I was in 15, 15, 12 to, mm. to the Crusaders. What happens? I and mean, you spoke about in terms of the Blues. When you get to that um, scoring a try, they score that um, Sevier Reese try. But what do they do? They back it up again with another try. And, and now that arm wrestle that you've had for the majority of the game, 60 odd minutes of the game, 
you, the game's blown out and you think, well, I'm chasing it now. And so the Chiefs ended up having to chase it. But what do the Crusaders do? They turn up another level and they say, well, we're going to work off your mistakes and then we're going to grind this game down. And that's the quality of the Crusaders. So that's where they're at their absolute best. When you know, other teams you know, can't seem to do that. It's a different different type of level. And, and that's where they got them at, in the end. The, the Chiefs were impressive. I like the way they, 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 they worked their set-piece moves, particularly off scrum. But it was that, that period, you know, 20 minutes to go, where they just ramped it up and they were really, really clinical, the Crusaders. I, I mean, losing Retallick's never that good, but, yeah. you know, I thought, I thought Barrett was really physical. You know, I know that he's probably not as tall as a lock. He's one of the shorter locks, and I know that he's been trying to work on his physicality, but I thought he was really good for long periods of time, just doing the hard yards, making big hits, carrying the ball hard. So I thought he was a really important replacement. He's not a replacement, he's obviously an all-black, but not having white lock out there, mm. um, he really stood up and brought something a bit different. Well, I think, as you know, we've spoken about locks in the past, who's the third lock, what are we going to do about, you know, is it going to be a loose forward that covers? He was good. Well, talking about the lock loose forward battle, Ken, what do you think of Tupai Va'i and playing him at six? Well, that's still a big question mark for us, isn't it? Like the players that have uh, that have been tried at six, Shannon Frizzell, um, Ethan Blackadder, um, Makiri Ioane, and then last year, a tremendous season of progress and development for Tupo. You know, defensively, he's a big unit. Very nice, got very nice soft hands um, for a big guy as well, and we all know that he can carry, he can carry hard uh, to post. So I definitely think he needs to be there um, or thereabouts, particularly if we want to get big, strong, and physical against those Northern Hemisphere teams that dusted us up last year. You don't agree, J.K.? No, no, I totally agree. Um, Frizzell and Tupo, I need to be the two sixes and just move forward with it. Um, and I'm saying that because you know that um, Akita I think is outstanding, but he's injured. And I just think you put these two boys and let them go head to head for the sixth jersey. And I think you keep after Scott Barrett's um, game on the weekend. You say you know you're our you're our third, and we've got some young guys coming in. That's good. But those two boys I like them. I think Frizzell's been strong as well. And we need that hard, you know, that hard ball carrier. But we also need that. Sting in defence. Mel, I want to talk to you about the fullbacks because we're always talking about Geordie Barrett and pumping him up and how good he is. But Will Jordan must be the form fullback in the competition right now. Oh, Seriously, they just, just keep battling out those two, eh? Geordie and, and and Will. I mean, what he did against the Chiefs. So we all know what he can do, you know, on attack with ball in hand. He makes breaks, keeping the ball alive. But what really impressed me was. How many turnovers he got? Look at that. Like, mm. I mean, there's no way fullback should go in there, mate. Don't bury your head in that sort of <laughs> stuff. But he did it three or four times. Um, and then he still has the ability to, to be able to finish his speed and his work rate. So he's, he, again, similar to, to Caleb Clark, he's finding a real groove, but he's at the top of his, you know, top of his game. And, and the way he's playing is amazing. JK, no? Well, no, I'm, I'm shaking my head, Mills, because I'm really worried that we're going to go, uh, righto, well, Geordie and Will are playing well, so let's put one on the wing. That's what I'm worried about. And I think we need to have that sort of internal competition. The only thing against Will is he can't kick a goal from 55 metres in a <laughs> test match. And that might give Geordie the edge. But I'm worried that they're going to go, they're both really good, we need to put them on the field. So we're going to put Geordie on the wing. So I'm worried about that because I don't think it's what we need to do. 18 test matches to go! <laughs> 18 I love test matches it. to go. Isra You're Israel, love Israel Dagg, Corey Jane, Ben Smith. They started that. They started, they started that. It. They started that whole the logic thing. Was that Mills, you probably the high ball. Yeah, the whole thing was we're a back three now. It doesn't matter where you play. But I just, I'm just not sure about combinations around that. Do you guys want time for the trivia question? Because we've got to jump in. If, if we want to do no. the trivia question I, today... I thought with Jake... the chemist warehouse and Eurofin, <laughs> I tried to get rid of this because it gives me a headache. <laughs> <laughs> you know where the Eurofin is, uh, JK. You shouldn't be worried. You always get this uh, question right. It is time for the trivia question. And remember, you can play along at home as well. We love it. Uh, this one, a little bit of an ode to Heritage Round over the weekend. Your question is, who's won the most Super Rugby titles as a player? Which player Ooh. has won the most Super Rugby titles? I reckon I'm backing Ken for this one. Is that a hint? Is that a hint? Do, we, do you want me to answer now? No, yeah, you can have a think about it. You can have a think about it, and so can you at home as well. But before we go, we've got a beautiful piece about David Harvelli playing his 100th match on the weekend, and it wasn't easy. He's a great story of resilience.
Yeah, I definitely, definitely had my doubts. Like, it was probably um, after the first club season and not making the under 20s, and then you know, sort of, sort of sat down with mum, like, and just said to her, like, this, you know, is probably it. Around not being able to get to the next level, like, I gave it a pretty good shot. small town, my Chueka, and uh, it's a place that I hold very close to my heart and I love going home and uh, seeing my friends and family. So, yeah, a lot of backyard rugby with my brother and heaps of, I guess, mates that played a lot of sports, so there was always something to do back home and um, it probably set me up in a way around uh, just getting myself out there and trying different things and fell in love with the game of rugby really early and, you know, with Dad playing a lot of rugby at um, sort of pushed me to, to play the best I could and, and being able to step out my, outside my comfort zone and going to boarding to Nelson College was was great as well. You know, I met um, a lot of my close mates that are in this team today. So, got Mitch Drummond, um, Ethan, Quinn. So they were all there when I went to Nelson College and, you know, definitely one of the first hurdles I experienced in my rugby career, like expecting to go over there and um, play a lot of first thing rugby, but, you know, it wasn't to be. and. Back then, there's a few eligibility rules that um, come into play, and you know, when I was that young, I probably couldn't see the the other side of it. You know, I was coming a half an hour down the road from what, you know, not coming out of the area. I was just moved to a, I guess, a bigger school that gave me another opportunity. So I was pretty frustrated and beat me to playing a lot of thirds rugby, and I guess I played a few senior B games as well when I was still at school. So. In a way, it probably just grew my hunger a lot more to, to prove to them that I was, that I wanted to be there. Here's a little show and go. Definitely, definitely had my doubts. Like, it was probably after the first club season and not making the under 20s, and then, you know, sort of, sort of sat down with mum, like, and just said to her like this, you know, it's probably it. Around not being able to get to the next level, like I gave it a pretty good shot. Luckily got the got the lifeline from Rangi to come up to Auckland and play for the under 20s. So that was sort of the, the extra push I needed. Wrapping around. Top Blacker they gave me the call and um, didn't, obviously didn't have his number. So yeah, just remember him saying, look, um, we've got a spot for you for the wider training group and you know we'd love for you to come and join us and um, we've seen you play the last couple of games with Tasman and we're really excited to have you down. It's a club where it's really family driven. It's a club that takes great pride in looking after um, their players, their staff and, and, and their families. So that's a big one for me as family, you know, what, what I do is um, to put a, put a smile on my parents' face and for them to be proud of me. So, you know, extremely grateful for what Chris A's have done for me. You know, they've given me everything that, in terms of my dream and being able to be here for so long and, you know, play the games that I've done, I'm, I'm grateful for that. It's a lot of hard work that goes in behind the scenes. And it's a huge opportunity to, to join our league crew that um, I've looked up to for so long. So. To be a part of that crew will be extra special and yeah, just gives me good spots thinking about it now actually. That was great. <laughs> Welcome back into the breakdown and as you can see we've got another special guest joining us on the panel from New Zealand Rugby, the CEO, the big boss, Mark Robinson. Welcome into the programme. Uh, you're in the hot seat straight away because you've got our trivia question to answer. Uh, but probably, shall we do you first? Because you know what no, the question no. is. No, he's probably going to go. Okay, okay. We won't go to you first. You can be our last this confident. time to give you time to think <laughs> about it. But this week's trivia question, if you missed it, who's won the most Super Rugby titles as a player? JK... Answer? Todd Blackadder. No. You changed Ken? your mind. Yeah. Uh, Reuben Thorne. Is it? Oh, that's what I was going to say. Oh, what a <laughs> 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 Reuben <laughs> Ralph. He's got oh, Caleb Ralph. Reuben Ralph. Ralph. <laughs> say, I don't want He's, got, he's, just, he's just crossed out Caleb. <laughs> there is the answer, Reuben Thorne. You know how well you played with him. You knew the answer to that, didn't you, Mark? Uh, you had a sneaking suspicion. <laughs> so, uh, all great players up there and great guys too. Was this guy, was he underrated, JK? 
Yeah, totally. Well, no, not from those who played with them or against them. Mm. Um, there's certain players that come, ar come around that don't quite get um, the acknowledgement from the public. Alan Houston, one of the greatest fullbacks yeah. I ever played with, Ken. Yeah. Um, Petoni. Oh, unbelievable. He was, he was so gifted. I, I remember one day on the field, he, he got the ball, and at the same time, he dropped it to his foot and kicked it through for me. Like, stuff that you just wander at. And, and I think Ruben was one of those. But, Robbie, you played with him? Mm. Yeah, I mean, he was, uh, um, he was a great leader through that era that we um, saw there, really. Um, when he won a lot of those titles, um, so solid and dependable, you know, performed on the big stage, calm, great leadership. So yeah, uh, and, and a, had a had a, uh, a team anthem named after him as well. So what more do you want? Yeah. <laughs> you still remember the song? Uh, it was pretty straightforward. Not too many lyrics, so, so yeah, I do remember it. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, give us a turn. <laughs> well, since we've got you here, uh, we've actually got a surprise for you. So we're going to roll back uh, some of your great moments because, of course, you okay. played a bit of Super Rugby yourself, won a couple of titles too. You remember this like it was yesterday? Uh, not quite used to it. Yeah. Was it semi-final, was it? Semi-final against the Hollanders, maybe? Um, 2002. 2002. Yeah. That's a great dive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Again. Yeah, just with a little show and go. Yeah. Goodness me. Two in a row on the right edge, Robbo. Oh, yes. yeah. Yeah, that was, that was forward, turn, though. <laughs> that was forward. You wouldn't have got away with that. That would have been TMO today. Yeah, yeah. 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 Hey? Well, he's a solid achiever. Good memories, man. though. Oh, a great day. That was a great season. Obviously, I think that was the unbeaten year, wasn't it? So, didn't mean to bring that up, JK. But yeah. um, <laughs> <laughs> that was a really special season with um, you know, a great bunch of guys. And we had, a, we had a tremendous time also. So, yeah, really fond memories looking back. Before we let these guys uh, get into I was going to say, gonna... after that, I want to have a go. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to you one last time, um, because we've done this to Mills before, but do you mind just taking a wee strut around uh, the front of <laughs> the camera? Because you're really? good to awkward and really you're clearly sure that... very comfortable. So, <laughs> That's uh, what you want from oh, the yeah. studio, mate. I don't want to show these things up, so, so yeah. There you go. Yeah. Yeah. We just want to check only out the attire. Only briefly, Christy. <laughs> JK. Oh, yeah. nice. Oh, look at that. All right. nice. Now, I'll Thank tell you, you what. <laughs> that, that is actually a look in Europe. You just missed it with the jandals, I could have given you a pair of shoes and you would have nailed it. That's it's actually a new look. If you you uh, stole yeah. shoes. Well, I got reassured yeah. that no one would know about that. I got told <laughs> I'd be fine. So thanks for the stitch You're up. fine now. You're All fine right. now. And JK, yeah. your turn. Yeah, no, I th I, a really, really interesting trip for you, Robbo, up north. Um, lots going on in our game. I wanted to ask you about um, the, the CVC, who are the commercial partners of the Six Nations. They came out about six weeks ago and said a joint statement with the Six Nations know the South Africans aren't going to join. But my question is, you know, Silver Lakes and CVC, are they going to have more say around the board table on some of the commercial decisions that are going forward? Well, I mean, it's, a, it's a fair question. The first thing I'd say is that obviously we've still got a little bit of time um, to play through yet before we're certain that Silver Lake will be an investment partner with New Zealand Rugby. Obviously, that decision's now sitting with our provincial unions to ratify at the AGM at the end of April. Um, on the basis that it may um, well come to fruition, uh, we've been pretty clear that um, you know Silver Lake would be a an investment partner associated with a lot of decisions and strategy associated with the commercial side of the game. But there's no day, doubt that you know, a lot of the commercial value associated with the game is driven through international rugby and professional rugby. So it, it's fair to say that they would be um, party to conversations that we're talking about in terms of creating future value. Whether we'd go as far as having joint statements, that's something we certainly haven't discussed. Silver Lake have certainly, through all the process over the last 18 months or so, um, been more than comfortable sitting you know, behind the scenes and, and remaining largely silent, which we've all been comfortable with. Well, I thought it was a done deal, mate. So are, the, are you confident it's going to go through with the, the NBC? I mean, what are you hearing? Well, that, that's, um, that's what we're spending a lot of time at the moment um, with our provincial... Um, unions and the Māori Rugby Board, who are the key members that will vote at the AGM, making sure they understand everything associated with the proposal. Um, you know, a lot of... Uh, back into the, that Zoom mode, we were spending a lot of time with them, making sure that every part of the proposal they understand so they can make an informed decision at the end of April. We're certainly hopeful. We've, we've been very clear. We think it's the right thing for the game going forward. But ultimately, um, they are our members and, and they'll um, decide that at the end of April. Mark, you've been in conversations with the big wigs over in the UK. What's happening with South Africa? Are they staying in the rugby championship after 2025? Oh, look, we had some really um, positive, constructive meetings with Sansa um, uh, over the last few weeks. And, um, you know, we, we spent a lot of time talking about how we create value in the game and how we create, 
you know, opportunities also outside of the rugby championship in the Southern Hemisphere, how we create pathways for younger players as well, and looked at areas like the women's game as well. So certainly it was a, it was, it was really good firstly to be back face to face again and all spending time, not only around boardroom tables, but also connecting socially. You know, we've, we've missed that in the last two years and during that time it, it allows, um, you know, frustration and anxiety to create in when there's been so much change and, and challenge through the game. Um, but yeah, all I'd say is we, we certainly had a really good upfront um, conversations and I, and I think you know we've just got to keep working that over the next couple of years and see what we can craft for um, 26 onwards. Rob I want to talk about that, that women's game because we've seen in the end of your tour you know how much of a bigger gap it was between um, the Black Ferns and what happened over there given now that you're waiting until April for the AGM and, and the, the financial side of things I mean are you going to if, if it does go through and we're hoping it does um, you know is there a resource there to actually pump a bit of financial sort of support into the game after all picking what sort of that's sort of provided because you know it's, it's absolutely needed uh, yeah you're right Millsy. I mean um, we've been really clear over the last 18 months or so there's a number of areas of the game that need support so the women's game I mean we're, we're in the um, year of you know women's and girls and rugby this year there's so much amazing stuff happening um, we're about to get into the Pack 4 tournament after Super Rugby Old Picky. Um, uh, the Black Ferns will play Australia and then going into that massive World Cup at the end of the year. So um, there's so much that we're, we're looking forward to. We're, we want to invest more in the um, secondary school game as well around, um, around the girls, um, you know, first 15s and other development competitions in colleges. So there's so much to do in the area of the game, as there is in safety, as there is in technology, as there is in a whole lot of other areas around grassroots, where we believe we've got some broader strategies but simply need a, um, a proper resource to be able to invest. Oh, that was my next question, Robert. How, how do you guarantee the strategy for grassroots rugby going forward? How are you going to achieve that? Because, um, you know, I've been critical of the NPC spending a lot of their resource on their top side, but we actually need it in the, you know, just below that. So how do you guarantee the strategy? How do you get a group of people together to make sure that works? Well, certainly our, our team has spent um, a reasonable amount of time over the last, you know, 18 months to two years um, looking at a lot of areas of grassroots and firstly you've got to understand the problem don't you and, and, and be able to wrap some data around that so that you can make informed choices and, and inform your strategy um, and, and then decide where you're going to allocate resource and ultimately decide what the best way forward in a number of areas is. Um, so we, we believe we've done a lot of that work. We're certainly not saying we've got all the answers, but you know, there's been a lot of work looking at um, the nature of participation in secondary schools. There's been a lot of work looking at um, you know, different formats of the game, so less people on the field, different um, ideas around the rules of the game, so less contact, you know, how, we, how we create more opportunities for ball movement and, and ball and play time. So we feel like we're sitting on the cusp of having um, some really exciting ideas we want to invest in, and now it's just a case of, as Millsy said, hopefully you know, getting some um, support around the Silver Lake proposal, and then we can move forward with a lot of those things. Um, Rob, are you on the subject of um, women? There have been issues around lack of women in governance, lack of women in senior management. Um, lack of women in the elite coaching um, roles. Firstly, do you have a view on that? And secondly, um, do you think that Alpiki was... Um, can I put that question to you about Super Rugby, uh, Alpiki, in the context of what potential impact it could have on the Farah Palmer Cup? positively or negatively, given previous debates we've had over the years about, you remember when Super Rugby first came in, the provinces were up in arms that it was going to undermine the NPC. Mm. You know, it was a similar one when JK was coaching Japan when the Sunwolves came in. He was worried when his position as head coach that that would undermine the integrity of the Japan top league. So, mm. you know, I just wonder what the success of Old Picky Weather will be at the expense of the Farah Palmer Cup, which has been a tremendous success in the last couple of years. Mm. Yeah, so two parts to that question, Ken. Um, the first one, absolutely, we're committed as it relates to your, your question around um, opportunities for, for women coming through in different areas of the game. Uh, absolutely, we're committed to diversity and inclusion in our game um, and, and believe that we're doing a lot of good work at the moment trying to make sure we create those pathways. And that extends to you know, other areas such as ethnicity that we talked about before mm -hmm. around Moana Pacifica and the Drua coming into Super Rugby, obviously, but other opportunities for pathways there as it regards to um, ethnicity. Uh, the second part of the question, I guess, 
Um, when, when we talk to our players and we talk to our high performance people and, and community people with regards to Super Rugby Alpiki, we felt we needed in relation to the highest levels of, of competition for the Black Ferns and international rugby opportunities for pathways and to play at a higher level, similar I guess to what Super Rugby provided all those years ago in terms of the next stepping stone. So that was the main rationale for, uh, for that decision and I think we have to all agree the concentration of talent across those four teams has meant we saw a high standard play in preparation for the international um, windows coming up. I think if you fast forward and you allow yourself to dream a little bit too, the Super Rugby Pacific, if we think of how that relates to um, uh, the women's game, you know, are there opportunities to bring in Australia, maybe North America and Japan in time around that also as we see the game grow in, in those markets and um, you know, we're excited about those possibilities as well without again having all the answers yet. Uh, there's a, a segment that we've started, well, we haven't really, but I love this. Um, I'm starting it anyway. Voce de Corridoio, which means whispers in the corridor, which means you don't really know if they're true or not. But I was just wondering if you've heard these, Robbo, that uh, Sir Graham Henry is going to be helping our Black Ferns as selector, and Sir Wayne Smith, he's not a knight yet, but I'm going <laughs> to call him, I call him Sir yeah. Wayne. Yeah. Um, He's going to be helping in the in the technical role to try and get us another Women's Rugby World Cup. So, Voce de Corridor, we don't know if it's true or not. Just wondering if you know anything about it, being the boss. Well, I don't know if I've been in the corridor. I've been in, I've been in pretty mainstream media recently. <laughs> <laughs> oh, <laughs> oh, 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 well, the speculation has, you know, we're, we're going we're gonna to be being up front that we've got, um, you know, obviously some uh, information to share over the next sort of, you know, 10 to 12 days um, around uh, areas regarding the, the Black Ferns um, campaign and as it leads into the in the World Cup as well, so we'll, we'll talk more then. It'd be positive though, wouldn't it? I mean, how good would it be, people? So good. And it's very positive uh, to be able to have Wayne Smith on board as well. That one has been confirmed. Uh, before we let you go, and we are so thankful that you have come on board the show as well, uh, if you talk about the health of the game, what are New Zealand rugby's top three priorities at the moment? Oh, you know, you're all passionate um, people around the game. You know that there's so many things going on in the game at the moment. So I guess, um, for me, the first thing I'd say is the, the number one priority we have is the, the safety and welfare of all participants in our game, be that community level or the professional game. Player welfare is absolutely fundamental to us and, and we take that really seriously. If you look beyond that, I guess... Um, the, I guess if I had to choose four, there's four main things underpinning our, our strategy at the moment. One is what we, we call winning with mana, so being successful on the international stage and, and winning pinnacle events. Um, we want to drive more um, opportunities for, for rugby to be at the heart of our communities. So, you know, community rugby plays a big part of our strategy going forward and it's something we know we have to do more um, about. We care deeply about, um, I guess, the brands of our teams and um, the, the brand and the narrative around the game. That's important to us. And, and we know we've, we've got a lot uh, more work to do in terms of communicating you know, on a broader range of issues around the game as well and need to do better there. So we're working hard at that. And the last thing is to, um, I guess, unlock what we think is the commercial uh, opportunities associated with the game internationally um, for, for New Zealand rugby. And as part of that, also make sure the, the financial framework um, around the game is sound as well so that we create a sustainable footing going forward as we drive more, more growth, hopefully. So uh, a probably a long-winded answer, but um, that, that's, uh, I guess, a bit of a snapshot at the moment. Well, thank mm. you so much for sharing that with us. Mm. Thank you for coming on and being Pleasure. so open thanks, and thanks honest, so honest as well. We yeah. appreciate your time, mm. Mark Robinson. Um, right now, we are going to go to a wee throwback. Justin Marshall, he digs deep in the memory bank. Hey everyone, here it's a tweet, how good. Uh, so a memory for me is all the way back in 2004, uh, to give you a little bit of history behind the game, I had a knee injury from the week before and it was a week where I didn't train and it was touch and go whether I'd make the field and historically I'd missed a lot of big games in the past so uh, going through that week was quite emotional until I finally got the go ahead by Robbie the day before the game that I could actually play. I went out there with my knee all strapped up and I think because of all the emotion and the way that the week had gone and to finally get out there and then to get across the line and score a try, I think that emotion just came out of me. Um, weird thing is, I didn't really know how to express it properly because you're supposed to raise the roof and I think I was like raising the floor, but uh, that was just the euphoria of being able to be out there and play because I'd missed a lot in the past. Uh, conversely, a little bit of, I guess, karma is the week after we played the Brumbies in the final and I must admit that where the game was well gone and in the dying moments I got hit in a high shot, well I thought it was anyway, and with the game being gone, a different frustration and emotion came out which was uh, a little bit of anger and I uh, got involved in a bit of a tussle. And if you look really carefully, um, I actually managed to get a sneaky little right hand into Mark Gerard and just caught him on the chin. So yeah, two different weeks, two different scenarios, 
uh, but uh, that's my memories from 2004. Uh, enjoy Heritage Round, uh, such a good concept. Cheers. Welcome back into the breakdown. It is great to have you joining us and it was excellent to have the CEO of New Zealand Rugby come in here on the breakdown, JK, wasn't it? Yeah, because I thought the deal was done with Silver Lake, so that's good to know. <laughs> Looks like the players and the NZR are now aligned, which is fantastic. And I just hope that the, um, you know, the NPC sides are going to get together and, and make the right decision. Really confident that... Um, you know, it's the right thing, I am. And good news about some stuff and some investment going into the women's game. Yeah, again. yeah. and that was, a, you know, that was a very big question you asked about the sustainability of the game at grassroots level. That's the biggest challenge facing our game, is um, the volunteers, uh, the clubs, the 603 um, clubs that are, that are still there, some of them only just um, amalgamation, finding time for our volunteers, seven-day working week. Um, pressure on families, pressure on kids, all of those kinds of um, things. So, you know, we can talk about the high-profile Silver Lake type deals, but we've got to make sure that our 9 and 10-year-old boys and girls, you know, can play and enjoy the game as well. And he did say that was one of the priorities Look, for them, wasn't yeah, it? They're finally moving forward, which is fantastic. Just get that deal done. <laughs> <laughs> April, Show I don't want to come back money. in April and it's not, please. <laughs> if you give me 8%, I'll get it done. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it for 5 I'll do it for 2 <laughs> Seriously. Uh, we've got more rugby coming up this week. We have four games of rugby on New Zealand soil Tuesday. We only have to wait. Two more sleeps. JK, you get to see your Blues back in action, so you'll be happy. Taking on Moana Pacifica, uh, this is two games for them, uh, Tuesday and then Saturday. So how do they skin this cat? Which players are we going to see out there? I don't care. I just love midweek footy. <laughs> how good is it? What else, what else are you going to do on a Tuesday night? <laughs> exactly. Uh, get out there and get it I, done. I have some uh, I chips, I would love to them to agree on a game on on Saturday at Mount Samar and said, hey, double points. Why couldn't we have that? Have time to recover? Oh, you only want one game to do. Yeah. Look, I think it's <laughs> going to be interesting. To get back to your question, Kirsty. Uh, you know, do they, do they play the guys that haven't had a run both sides? Uh, I would say that if you're a betting man, Ken, you look at the table and go, is this going to be worth actually putting... You know, a whole side out there, or do you put your half side out there? Moana Pacifica probably don't have the depth of squad, so I think it'll be a selection one, and it'll be an intriguing one just to see what both sides do, because you're still five points, and you know, like if they can, it's a lot at the end. It will not <laughs> big, bigger, more important for the Blues possibly. It will not surprise me if this is one of the highest-rated games on television in 2022. I think with the sheer wave of emotion. And, um, and love that's been exhibited for, uh, for Moana Pacifica. There was never uh, Super Rugby on a Tuesday night, so there will be a whole new audience that will be switched onto it here in New Zealand and around the world. Um, and obviously that adds to the, um, adds to the interest um, of the game. And one of the difficulties for Aaron and Philo is that all of the top players in Moana Pacifica will want to play the Blues, yeah. every single one of them. So how they manage, how they manage the big-time players who, and some of them who put in an enormous effort um, the other night are going to need a break, but n none of them will. Well, you know what the mentality's like. The boys, here's a, you know, here's a chance to play against, you know, the big dogs of provincial. And Rather do that and train emails. Yeah, hey. Exactly. Captain's run. Hey, captain's run every day and that's it. No contact. Thank you. We mentioned Wayne Smith earlier because he is now a part of the Black Ferns for this year, which is just awesome. But he's also got a charity that he's doing at the moment, isn't he? He yeah. has. Ken, you know about that. I, I didn't get the text, mate. <laughs> but disappointed, Smithy. Can you Smithy, got the memo? Smithy, what about my text, mate? <laughs> yes, it's a fundraiser on um, on Facebook. Uh, NZFCE is the uh, is the page that you can go to. Everybody knows that um, Smithy's been dealing with. Uh, uh, issue that's been close to his family as well, with a son suffering from cerebral palsy. So he's very, uh, very supportive of this, as are many of us in the New Zealand Foundation for Conductive Education. So if you go to that Facebook page and um, press your love heart, then um, that will help them gain more resources to address something in our society and our communities that's very close to many of us. Awesome. Yeah. I feel like we could go ahead to uh, the games next, Friday, Saturday, Sunday, but it's fitting, isn't it, um, with two proud Pacifica men on the panel to finish with Moana Pacifica and everything that they have achieved over the weekend. 
Oh, so special. I mean, even now, I'm still proud of the, of the fact that you see those images and, and what that's produced. So imagine the effect, the roll-on effect that's yeah. had in the community, especially in Auckland as well, where the majority of uh, Pacific Island people, you know, live. So I'm looking forward to, to Tuesday night. I'm looking forward to sort of how... I'm looking forward to the music there too, Kirsty, because uh, even, even that sort of almost got me out there dancing some more. So I don't know if Fauna, you would have been out there for sure. <laughs> yeah, well, I, you know, haven't we had many debates over the years about how do we properly recognise and pay respect and, um, to their contribution at all levels of New Zealand rugby, which has been significant, not only uh, the All Blacks, the Moana Pacific concept, we talked about it, we talked about it. Um, now, now it's a reality. They've got their first win after only three games in the, in the competition. Love it. Hope they beat the Highlanders. Hope they beat the Hurricanes. Hope they beat the Crusaders. But um, I don't want them to win. Blues are coming on Tuesday. <laughs> Could happen, JK. Two games this week. Uh, you just never know. That is the good thing about this competition. Excellent work from all of you. Thank you so much for coming on tonight, Ken. Um, and we'll see plenty more of you as well. And thank you at home uh, for joining us, for tuning in every Sunday. We do hope you enjoyed the programme and we will see you once again next Sunday. Enjoy the game on Tuesday. Around the corner for Tima Fanga Nuku. And away is up for